Does everyone here know how to see a Class Connect recording? You do? Okay. So I have been storing the links to the recordings in our Class Connect folder. So if you want to go and see any of those other ones, that's where I'm keeping them for the entire year. And I'm also going to try to make sure I describe what we talk about in each one so that if you need to go back to it for a reference, you can. But I think everything should be pretty straightforward. So today we're diving into a new point in history, but we're going to start off with this big question. How can art tell a story? So in the chat box, if you have an idea of a way in which art can tell a story, type it out. Imagery, symbolism? Yes, definitely. Any other ideas? Context. Mm -hmm. A historical story, for sure. In the 1800s, it was seen as rebellious to paint landscapes without having a historical story involved in them. Color, style, ones that show lessons or morals. Technique and medium. So you guys have a whole bunch of ideas on how art can tell a story. We're going to look at probably one of the oldest stories we have in paintings today. Raise your hand if this image looks familiar to you. Yeah. So one person. Cool. So maybe you've seen this piece in particular. Um, but uh, for those of you that this is different, the Cape Paintings of France, right. Um, I want you guys to type, everybody type one question in the box below about the painting you see right here. It could be any question. We'll see if I can answer it. Is it cave art? Yes. <laughs> this is most certainly painted in a cave. See some other people typing. How do they get the colors for the horse? Ooh, good question. So, um, the ancient media that they would use back in the day could be anything from other rock to crushed berries. Um, and there are different textures that have different colors. Um, does it have a meaning behind it? We think it does, actually. And you can really tell this based on how the animal is shaped. What's something that seems just way too small for this animal? The proportions are weird. The head is way too small. The feet also don't really seem like they could be strong enough to hold this horse up. Yeah, the head and the feet are way too small. So this guy, if you notice his big belly here, is probably the fattest horse you have ever seen. And these fat horses and cows and bulls and all these other animals are completely covering the cave walls. Why would um, an early human, this is before domesticating the horse, want to paint pictures of fat horses. Hunting, right, yeah. This was food. So this is an image of food. That's what we believe the meaning is about. Good meat, <laughs> for sure, especially back in the day. Um, let me make sure I answered this. Uh, around Luxembourg, so technically this area is Lascaux. So I'm going to type it right here in the box. L A S or C A U X. So Lascaux. And Lascaux, France, is just lined with all these um, 
the stone fragments is just truly really lined with all these limestone caves and walls. And let's see. I think I answered the questions. So now it's time for tea. Other kids in the area of paintings and other animals and marks we split. Yeah. Good point, Gregory. You already know so much. All right, so it's tea time. This is the one time in which I'll use the video. Um, so I spoke to you guys last week about uh, the um, how it can actually help you to learn and remember something by holding something warm or um, uh, anything warm, really. And it's actually a psychological connection to holding warm things in a conversation. This is why they believe in movies um, there's always, uh, as a guy or girl want to go out for their first date, they always say, do you want to get a cup of coffee? And that's because if you're holding something warm, you automatically, OK, no hot that tea. Maybe you can have hot cocoa. <laughs> Um, or just just something warm in general. You don't actually have to drink it. That's the interesting part. You don't have to drink this, but psychologically, if you're holding something warm, you have warmer feelings to whatever you're focusing on. So, um, for example, if you're going out for your first date, it's best to get something warm as opposed to like a Slurpee, right? <laughs> it is an opposite effect. But they, uh, show, there is, there's actually a lot of studies on this. So holding something warm actually helps you to not only remember, but have warmer feelings towards the subject. So when I used to teach in brick and mortar, I always had tea time with uh, my art history lessons on Mondays. So that's when we used to have them. And students would hold a cup of tea, and they, they wouldn't even have to drink it. But it would actually warm them up to art history, literally. OK, this is green tea today. I've already helped myself to some of it. So we're looking here at um, your horses of the skull. You only really see one in this image, but this is a cave filled with other horses. You know, the story and how this was found really should be a Disney movie. I'm really surprised that there is no movie of it. If you can find one, that'd be great. Right, two boys. The two boys are going on a hike. This is in like 1940s. They were playing. There were like some slightly different versions, but essentially they were, they were out and about with their dog. And they were walking along uh, with some hiking trails through the limestone areas. And all of a sudden, their dog disappeared. They couldn't find him. Uh, they walk over to where they last saw him, and then they fell down through an air shaft into this cave. Luckily, one of them happened to have a flashlight on them because uh, they had been walking in the evening. And they turn it on and look around, and it's filled with all of these animal paintings. So this is the first time that this cave had been accessed in, I believe, almost 17,000 years. It's made in 15,000 BC. Um, it was really hard to find these boys, too. I think they were able to call out and have people come up above. But it wasn't just in the cave entrance, if you actually go into the main entrance in this and let go area. To find this cave, you'd have to go deep into um, a ravine and then essentially climb up. We found that the prehistoric people actually built scaffolding all the way up into this little space. And there's evidence of early candles on the ground. Do you guys know what the early people would make uh, candles out of? Any guesses? Tallow and fat, right. Wax. Yeah, wax is harder to come by back then. Uh, bees actually were, in the, you know, in a lot of cultures today, honey and bees are really like uh, still hard to come by. And you have to really work for it, if you can imagine. But animal fat is a lot easier to come by, especially if you have a, a hunting-based um, society. So they would actually burn fat on the ground as early candles. And so there's smoke definitely filling up the central area. Good. I'm glad that you go for it. Um, and the early man also used every part of the animal. So any guesses as to how they got the black color uh, that outlines the edge of the horse? How would you get that black? Burnt something. What part of the animal would you think they would have burnt? 
Bones. Yes. Actually, this is the same thing that uh, in later on in Japan that ink was made out of. So black India ink. I have a bottle. The original version of your black ink is actually burnt. You can see right how rich that is. Uh, it's actually burnt and charred animal bone in which the marrow would actually mix in and make a sort of um, a pellet or like a looks like kind of like a patty. So then you would get your brush wet, dip it, and then the the fat would start to loosen up essentially, or the marrow would loosen up, and you could paint with it. Um, this is probably a little bit more rugged. They probably actually put the bone in the fire and just charred the end of it, and then drew with that. But there's lots of other processes here. Cool but gross. Yes, I think you defined all ancient art. Cool but gross. Uh, people are willing to do a lot. I get a lot of emails all of a sudden. Um, so another thing is the soft edges that you see of this painting on the wall. How do you think they got that soft sort of gradient? It's hard to get with a brush. Any guesses? Mm. Feather. No, not quite. This is actually something uh, that's really surprised us. So today, if you were to get an airbrushed looked image, what would you have to use? You see these at the mall, I'm sure, if you go. Compressed air, right. We actually found that these ancient people would take a reed from, the ne from next to the river. And it, if you see a reed, it grows kind of like bamboo, but it's hollow. And it becomes a straw. And they would crush these toxic berries in their mouth. Uh-huh. And blow the juice onto the wall. Literally going, right? Do you think they knew the berries were toxic? This is a tricky question. After so many years, they definitely knew the berries were toxic, yet they still chose um, Why would so many people, why would people choose to poison themselves for their art? It's kind of this almost romantic people dying for their art. Why would they be willing to die for it? To be able to make their pictures to pass their story? Yes, definitely. So these pictures were incredibly important. But remember, uh, we just found out from the last work last week with the Mac of Pan's Cat Pebble that there's already these beginning ideas of faith. And we have a new concept based on this area that there might be a different view on early men and how they practice their faith. So this is the story they wanted to pass on. The area that you're in, in the cave, is really difficult to get to. We actually found that people did not live in this part of the cave. It was definitely visited a lot, but people wouldn't live there. So what was this cave? Any idea? These are the clues that archaeologists put together. It's a religious place. Yes, we actually believe this was an early, yeah, a ceremonial, a sort of temple in the beginning. Something that was willing to, people were willing to hide and climb to and visit, but you weren't meant to sleep there. Now I have one last question here, and this is us putting our clues together about early man. Um, speaking of early man, we had all these paintings on the walls, and then beneath them at the bottom, we had the first artist signatures, and they were handprints. So there were handprints that artists would put up on the wall and use that reed to blow the berry juice over and lift off. Now, there are some statistically some small differences, but they do exist between male and female hands. And statistically, who do you think there were more handprints of? Give me a check if you think female and X if you think male. Oh, we're divided. Still divided. 
Is there any time vacant? Okay. So it was in fact more female than male, which is it blew the art world by storm by finding out this little itty bitty thing that completely changed the story of how we saw um, the ancient world. So if there are more women handprints on the wall, yeah, um, so if there are more ha women handprints on the wall, which gender is most likely to be in charge of religion? Uh, women had a higher place in society, for sure. Essentially, women and females. So essentially, what we know of the ancient world really up until, I guess, um, you happened for a long time that the having one ruler that controls both military and state is actually a pretty new thing in the human history. But there used to always be, from what we know of, two rulers in the ancient world. Essentially, if a woman could survive childbirth, which was very difficult, you know, there's 30 to 50 percent chance that she would not. Um, if a woman could survive childbirth or multiple, multiple childbirths, she could essentially live forever. Because what we know is that there is very little hunting and uh, danger outside of the cave for most women. And this, you know, obviously changes site by site. However, men who did not have to survive childbirth, um, thanks to their anatomy, had a much higher chance of possible death rate outside the cave, right? So imagine uh, hunting down a boar, uh, not fully killing it, like a tusk slipping. There's lots of possibilities. There's lots of possible injuries that could bring you down. Um, so what we know of is that in these early societies, women would often run, essentially, the community and the religious side to the interior, whereas men were more known as the war chieftain and we dealt with the exterior. And this is something that you see really continue, like starting in the ancient world, trickling through to our modern societies, right? Uh, you see this heavily in ancient Rome as well, in ancient Greece, with the sort of motif that continues on in our world. But this is where we see a, a big divide. That's how Native American tribes are often run. Yeah, you know, obviously it changes from one nation to the next. You know, it's not 100% um, for every nation everywhere. But we have found these origins of societies. And this is a really big revelation. What this requires? You mean this session, Brandon? Not sure? All right, I'll let you elaborate in a second. Um, so uh, we're seeing just or the origins of um, our own nations as well. Turn off the video now. Story time. We're going to move on to a little exercise here. I have here for you a cave wall. Um, for everyone in this room, if you guys could use your drawing tools, which I will activate, you guys should have it now. Use your drawing tool here, and I want you guys to um, draw something. This image does not have to be beautiful. It can be very crude if you want to. Um, draw something that you think uh, should last for the next, I don't know, 20,000 years. And keep in mind, do you really think English language will be around 20,000 years from now? This will be a little exercise. What's something that you would want to tell someone thousands of years from now? You can give them a warning. You can have a prayer or a hope. Hmm. This exercise is actually inspired by an article that I once read where 
essentially there's a nuclear waste facility where they're trying to bury um, very active nuclear waste deep, deep into the ground. And they sent out a contest, essentially, to try and ask artists what is a symbol that could last thousands of years from now when the waste is still active, but maybe our culture isn't? What is a warning we can leave? So they had to call up to all these artists to ask to come up with a symbol of what is a forever warning. So I see a cross. <laughs> Keep trying to zoom in. I wonder what's happening down here. So for those who have just joined us, right now we're doing an exercise, drawing on a cave wall. We're trying to come up with a symbol that we would want to share with someone 20,000 years from now. Uh, Brandon, I can answer your question at the end for the hands-on activity. Okay, cool. Oh, I see something like a nuclear waste facility forming over here. Yeah, let's put one more drawing on the board, guys. Something interesting, a lot of cultures actually think that um, even numbers are bad luck <laughs> and odd numbers are much luckier. Ooh, peace. So they have to ask yourself a question. So 20,000 years from now and you came up to see these symbols and you had no idea about the ancient people. So it's kind of like we are, we're just trying to put clues together. What's another way you can interpret this peace sign? What might it look like to you? If you can write in the chat box. So if you knew nothing about our culture, what would it kind of look like? Are we stuck? <laughs> Too big of a question. This kind of would look like, to me, I see almost like a mountain and then like a two halved moons, right? So if I knew nothing of this culture, I could come up with a different meaning for what that is. The same thing over here for the cross. If you knew nothing of Christianity, Right, we're, right now I'm asking everyone, if you're 20,000 years, uh, if it's 20,000 years from now and you come across these symbols in a cave but knew nothing about the people who created it, what are some other interpretations of these symbols we could have? I said that I can interpret, it, I can interpret the peace sign to be something different than what it is, but what if you knew nothing of Christianity and you see a cross? What might you think it could be? What if math doesn't exist, guys? It wouldn't even look like a, a stretched out plus sign anymore. Yeah, right? That's what I was thinking too. The same thing here. What if our English language doesn't exist and the punctuation mark goes away, the exclamation mark? Um, how we know if that's urgent or not, right? But what if the color wears away over time? Speaking of which, um, I'm going to go back to the last slide real quick just to give you guys the image again. Do you think you can see this painting in person anymore? Give me a check if you think yes, X if you think no. The X's are correct. As it turns out, yes, 
They're off limits unless you are an archaeologist who has permission from the state. You're right, because of oxidation. Elizabeth, you know all about this piece. Um, so uh, the first viewers who came in in the 50s actually had, um, there was more deterioration in, I think, two years than there was in 20,000 because everyone was breathing and bringing molds in from their shoes from outside. This little air chamber in the cave all of a sudden was uh, this tired climate, uh, this entire climate fell apart. And that's why actually today in order to preserve some artworks, if you go to certain museums, the glass cases are climate controlled. I was at a, the university, it was a university museum that had these ancient and everyone um, who worked on the, uh, all the, every time, every single scroll had its own little environment and you had to walk around with like things on your shoes and stuff. Yes, like the Declaration of Independence, right. So that paper wasn't meant to last um, as long as our country has. Uh, those papers like that were not considered what we call archival. So they have to do everything they can to try and protect it and it has its own little, little chamber. Okay, so how would you guys describe the style of this artwork? So if you were to describe this to someone who never saw the, saw the image before, actually what we'll do is we'll split up. Raise your hand. Everyone raise your hand and I'll put you in a group. Okay. We'll say odds will get processed. So if you guys could using using your uh, text tool, tell me how this was made. We're doing just a quick review. Um, even tell try to describe the artwork as if someone's never seen it before. So the style, would you say it's very delicately painted, or does it look kind of crude, right? I'll give you guys a couple minutes to do that. Blowing toxic berries, right, we'll definitely remember that. Ooh, minimalistic. Good. That's another way we can describe it. It's minimalistic, but there's some color to it too, right? Maybe you could say natural tones. Ooh, religious, definitely. You can add that in there into the, the style. It's almost devotional. We believe the reason why they kept drawing fat animals was because it was some sort of prayer or wish um, that by drawing it, there could be conjuring it. You have to remember, this is sort of part of what art history is. Um, it's grounded in what evidence we can assume, but we could be completely wrong. And that's kind of the fun, exciting part of our history. You might be wrong at any point. Um, but especially in the early days, you're just trying to put clues together to figure out what we can about a society. Yeah, I would say uh, that this artwork is minimalistic or minimal, um, devotional, natural tone. And the process is on point that these artists were willing to use toxic materials and burn bro uh, bone fragments and crushed rock. Excellent. Okay. So next, what we're going to do is use our short-term and long-term memory here. We're going to compare and contrast these two artworks right here. 
So just like last week, on the left side, um, if, you, if there's something particular to horses of Lascaux that you can describe it as that does not relate to Macapan's cat pebbles, put it there. The same thing if it's something particular to Macapan's cat pebbles, right? And then the things that they have in common, put in the center. Horse tracks, made by nature, right. A good one. Created by someone, created by a man slash woman. They're both old. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> yeah? Kind of the religious overlap here. So, does anyone remember what modern day country Macapanscat is in? Not Peru, no. This is uh, the uh, origin of humanity. From what we know, what country is this? Right, so let's go as in France. Where is in Mexico? Africa, right. So if someone wants to put Africa over there, you know, consider how long uh, it took for people to travel from Macapanca all the way up to uh, the limestone area. Or something is in uh, Middle East, Elizabeth. Yeah, that happened later, but not with Macapanca. So people really did just spread out from what we, uh, from the evidence that we've seen. There's actually some interesting crossovers in areas like Turkey. So what's, what's something cool to note is that people have always lived in limestone cliffs. So they are the only stones that make um, caves big enough for us. And so there's actually a literally a Neanderthal and I believe a Cro-Magnon settlement that we saw in Turkey that uh, one, they were, they were still raised. The Neanderthals lived on one side of the cliff, and then the uh, Cro-Magnon lived on the other. Which is kind of crazy. Okay. Guys, I just talking through this today. So I'm going to review this real quick. Um, Horse of Lascaux is created by someone, <laughs> um, made by a man and woman. It uses a variety of materials it's from France, ancient France. Um, Macapanset pebble is made by nature, it used only one material. And um, I feel like we should add one more thing in there. Oh, I think we lost Africa. That's where we lost. It was here. Um, they're both old, uh, they're both ancient, and they're both of religious significance. And I think they are, what, 10,000 years apart? Okay. So how did horses of Lascaux affect the art world? So there's two ways you can consider this. How would this have changed how we saw art when people discovered it? Or you can consider um, what, happened, uh, what happened to art after people uh, start, I guess, stopped or started painting on the walls. How does this affect the art world? Mm hmm That's a huge thing too. It really took till ancient Greece uh, for artists to start writing down their names on their artwork. And that's the thing too, it's like women were definitely creating art in, uh, during those uh, male occupied times. They just were not honored in the same way. So their work wouldn't get into gallery exhibits, their work wouldn't get into museums or be bought. It was treated as a hobby.
that's a big one right there. Are there any others? Any other ways that this work could affect our world? Maybe think on the spiritual side. Maybe Elizabeth has read the first comment. Let's have someone else write a comment. I see Madison's typing, so maybe she's preparing hers. Um, Star, I know you joined us late, but could you add a comment in here? And how do you think a cave painting might have affected the history of art? Might, how might it have it as, how might have, have it, I cannot see this right today, I'm sorry. <laughs> how did it impact the world? I'm sorry. One more idea there, and then we'll move on. And I'm going to dedicate the last 10 minutes of class today to helping out with people's questions. We'll talk a little bit more about the art history paper if you want. I think about everyone here is in good hands with that, though. All right, well, how did discovering this painting change the story of art history? Ah, thank you. So it's ancient history to the present? Yes. We actually found this cave. And guys, this is also technically old news, too. There are actually many caves that are much older now, we found. But this was the first one that really you know, shook the news uh, because it was found in 1940. But we found other places since then. There's also sculptures in here as well. Thank you. So yeah, so in current day, it brought ancient history to the present, and we were able to understand a little bit more about our shared past. Okay, so everyone can clear a box here. So how does knowing about this artwork or the artist impact your own art or your own work? So maybe you can consider a material approach and how it can impact impact your own work. Maybe you can consider the purpose of your own work. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six of us in here, so we should have six boxes filled. Yes, be creative with what you have. Preach, that's a good summary there, Elizabeth. We have five more to go. Art can be created with anything, truly with anything. You're right. Expand. You can use other materials other than pen, pencil, markers, and paint to create artwork. Very true.
four responses now. That's almost as many. Gregory responded. Madison responded. Star responded. Um, Randon and Sinai. Can you tell us how this new knowledge can impact how you create your own work? Or how you perceive your own work? We'll give these guys a couple minutes to tell us their tale, and then we'll move on. See a couple of people typing. Yeah, that's good. You got nothing? <laughs> Yeah, we do seem to have something significant to remember. So maybe you guys, um, you put mine on the phone. Oh, I got mixed up. Which one do you, is yours? Is it hidden? So right now I see Elizabeth, Gregory, Madison. Oh, wait, two Madison? Star. You got to go. Okay, bye. <laughs> Um, let's see. We'll help you out, Brandon. You are one that surprised me. You down yourself on how well you can do, but you came out with a solid product with your last artwork that you've made. Um, so, I mean, I would, I would say that I can, you know, maybe continuing to... Continuing to work, like understanding that it could be a long-term thing. That's what we can get from this. Let's see here. Um, I'm going to go to the last slide here, which is probably what you've been thinking of, <laughs> but uh, can continue to think of now. So what's something in your house you can make paint out of? Now, when I say in your house, it's that also could be like in your yard. What's something that you can safely make paint out of? And I've seen people make paint out of some crazy things. So we're not going to completely emulate the um, the old world. We're not going to put poisonous things in our mouth. <laughs> right, tomato sauce. Ah, oh, that's perfect. I have distinct memories of being a kindergartner and having an assignment in which I had to paint with chocolate sauce. Fruit? So we're thinking edible things right now. What's that thing that's not edible but also not toxic? that you can paint with. Dirt, right. <laughs> That's the old school material. Mud in general. Mud's a classic thing to paint with. I don't know if any of you did this as a kid but would go by a river and like build build things out of the clay from there. Flour, salt, and food coloring in water. Brandon, look at you. You got a little bit of this. <laughs> yeah, you can make whole paintings with that. Now, to give you a little frame of reference, artists have to deal with this all the time. Sometimes it's due to lack of materials, and sometimes it's from an oppressive space, um, not being allowed to create art. So, for example, in, up through the 80s in the Cold War, in order to make art in Russia, you had to have a license given by the state, meaning you were not allowed to buy paint supplies unless you had um, a license to buy it with. Kind of like how you can't buy certain things without a license now in our state, but those are uh, mostly drug related. Um, this, however, was about you had to have a license to be an artist. So there were these uh, countercultural, rebellious artists who would paint illegally. They couldn't get the materials that they needed, so they found materials. And I saw this um, painting that was 
super detailed and gorgeous and with all these values, but it was completely done in gravy. So the artist just used gravy from the house <laughs> and painted it. And the paper he used was essentially like a packing paper or a wrapping paper. So he couldn't even get fine quality artist paper. Coffee too, oh yeah. Coffee, if you paint with coffee, everybody appreciates the artwork that you make. Makeup, totally. Um, you know, and it also does depend on brand as to how well it will last, as always. <laughs> um, but I've actually had students who would go to the Dollar Tree and collect makeup. And they would get, especially mascara wands, believe it or not, you can get some really cool textures painting with that wand that you can't do with just a normal pen. Uh, nail polish, yes, for sure. It's stinky, but it can be so beautiful. Yeah, I actually am a... Uh, the side business, I make jewelry and crowns for weddings, and I had someone order a rose gold crown, and I use a sort of gilded paint and metal paint to work with, but that does not come in rose gold. So I had to make, make an entire bridal clown, um, crown using rose gold nail polish. But I have current experience with that one, too. Great. Good job. Good job, Okay. okay. So in these last minutes here, I'm going to be around to answer questions and help people out. So if you have a question about any of the assignments, I'm going to answer about turning things in, the bright familiar nail polish. Um, if there's any questions about uh, the rest of the course, um, I can do that now. If you are solid and don't have any questions and need to jump, jump ship, you may. So I think I was going to answer the question about submitting or doing your project as we speak. Well, that's probably why I wasn't talking. That's right. Um, also, guys, uh, just be mindful. I'm changing the times. I'm going to make sure that all the due dates actually end up being at 11.59 p.m. because I understand that what most of you guys have. So I'm not too much of a stickler on if something is turning in late, as if you were here in the, in the class on Friday, you probably heard that as well. Um, but I'm also going to change those times to 11.59, so it's to everyone's benefit. So, Brandon, was I going to answer your question? Did you have a, a question about how to turn in a hands-on assignment? Yes, okay. Let me see here. I'm going to... I'm going to application share in just a second. And we'll just walk through that together. Um, share. All right. Can, yes, you may leave. Thanks to Nye. You can't remember how? Okay. So do you, can you see the application? Have a great day. Yes. Okay. So you should, whoop, should be here. You should be able to scroll down here. And I believe today's a quiz. It should be this one right here, September 19th. And you click on this link. I don't know what works best for you guys, but yeah, you should be able to add your file here and then hit submit. Okay, does that help? There, yes, buzzword quizzes are only on required classes. Thanks for asking, Madison. Are there any other questions? No? Gregory, how are you doing? Oh, it's cool. I hope you have a good day. <laughs> All right. I'm going to turn off this recording.